Now then, plenty to chat on Whistle Watch this week. Did Freddie Stewart deserve a red card? Was Fico's tackle more than a penalty? And what about Willis's challenge? Was that a deserved one? We'll find out in Whistle Watch. Well, let's start with the big talking point from the weekend, which uh, pretty much everybody has had their say on. And I have to say, the split is probably, well, I would simply say probably 60-40 in in the yellow camp or in the non-red card camp. So I want you to try and take your emotions out of the decision making or your view on it because if you're English, you're going to have a different view to probably most Irish. And also as well, if you are one of these in the camp that think that the red card spoils the game, you're automatically going to be thinking you don't like that red card. So the referee has to get rid of all that emotions. He has to deal with the facts. And it comes down simply to this. Does he believe there has been foul play. And if there's foul play, he then goes to mitigation and he goes to degree of danger. And if you look at it, look at the way the referee deals with it, it is very difficult to argue with his thought process and of a red card. So we can follow and we can agree with a red card with the referee making the decision on the day that there is foul play. So what he thinks is, he believes that Freddie Stewart is in a position where he could have changed what he was going to do next. And because of that, we have foul play, we have head contact, we have high degree of danger. We don't have really much mitigation to take it down from a red, although some may argue that there is, and therefore we have a red card. Totally understandable decision. And when I'm looking at that decision myself, I'm thinking, do you know what? It's very difficult to argue with exactly what Jack Piper has seen and why he's giving a red card. Now let's go to the yellow card camp, which most, some are not even on a yellow card, but most of you are then if you're not on, on a red. So you feel that Freddie Stewart couldn't do anything different. He couldn't do nothing to change what happened next. And if that's what you feel, and if that's what the referee felt at the time, then the referee would have come from a red to a yellow, or may he even decided, well, there's, there's no foul player because there was nothing he could do. So even though you have head contact, you haven't got foul play and nobody's done nothing wrong, then we don't have a sanction. But most of you are on the yellow card, so you feel that there was nothing Freddie Stewart could have done differently. And if that's the case, then a yellow card is totally understandable. But to be honest, I'm looking at myself and thinking, I can't really disagree with a red card. Now, it'd be very unfair to me to sit here and tell you, I would have given a red or I would have given a yellow because I'm not in that moment on the field. So in that moment on the field, it all comes down to what the referee deals with, with the facts. Forget the emotions, forget that you're English, forget that you don't like a 15 against 14 game. All of that is out the window. You deal with the facts. And the facts are what Jacob Piper explained and we have a red card, which is not the wrong decision. But as I said, if you felt that Freddie Stewart couldn't do anything different and you give a yellow card, then I couldn't disagree with you as well. And I'm very sorry to tell you, for those who are sitting there and going, Nigel is sitting on the fence. I am not sitting on the fence because this is the game of rugby. You're going to have decisions which will just split the view on it. And this is one of them. Jack Willis yellow card is a deserved one. Well, there is a pick and drive, there is a turn, but there is no high degree of danger and head contact into the ground. And therefore, we come from the red to the yellow. So, yellow card, correct decision. Fico and Alan Wynne Jones, some will be asking, why isn't this a yellow card then? Well, slightly different. We have a lift, Alan Wynne Jones is quite low to the ground, he comes down pretty safely on his back, very low degree of danger. And I think uh, the FICO is more of a dynamic of the tackle rather than tipping and turning and driving. So here on this instance, a very low degree of danger and a sanction is a penalty only and the correct decision as well. Antonio knock on, was it deliberate? Well, is he trying to regather that ball and is he in a realistic position to regather that ball? So we don't have a slap, we don't have a deliberate knock in that sense. So we go on to the next stage. What was he trying to do? Was he trying to regather that ball? And if so, did he have a realistic chance of regathering it? And when you look at that, I would say he probably does. So to me, that is not an act of a deliberate knock on and there's enough opportunity. He may well have regathered that ball and therefore, a knock-on only is 
the correct decision. Itoji, quick tap, was Itoji offside? Itoji is on the try line, so if the quick tap is five metres out, you don't have to be 10 metres back because the try line is closer than 10 metres. So, he is back on the try line, he's legal. Once he comes up to make the tackle, Farrell, who is now retreating, is then put on side once Itoji, who was on side, passes him. So, the tackle, the turnover is completely legal, they're on side, play on, goal line dropout. And that's it for Whistle Watch. I hope that's helped clear up. I'm sure some of you will disagree, but that's the way the rugby is. Now then, time to answer your Emirates fans' questions. Right then, let's have a look at your questions. First one is from Anton de la U. Do you miss being in the middle of a test match call run and being with the players? Do you know what? I was walking through the crowd uh, in punditry up in Scotland, Ireland, and Scotland, Italy as well, uh, going to, 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 to the, into, this, into the stand and going through the crowd and chatting to people. And I was a little bit of me did miss the actual match day, you know, the getting off the bus, into the change rooms, going out to the tunnel, into the cauldron. So maybe a little bit of me is missing the actual match, but uh, I don't miss anything else that goes with it. So I don't miss it that I am sort of feeling sad, put it that way. I just sometimes miss it and remiss about the good old days. Gary Banks, Nigel, what's the correct penalty for collapsing a scrum? Well, the penalty is a sanction. If you're pushing off the mark or early engaged, then it tends to be a free kick, but pulling the scrum down, driving across, driving up, then that becomes a penalty. If it's a repeated infringement, then it becomes a yellow card. Or if you really felt that it was a one-off, really dangerous, cynical collapsed, then obviously you could deal with that as a yellow card as well. But usually the sanctions for collapsing a scrum are a penalty. Accelerated to a yellow card if a warning had been given or if it is a cynical act where a side is going backwards and it's a cynical ploy to take the scrum down. Zen Robot Ninja, uh, if you lost a bet and had to name a bull after a rugby player, what name would the poor bull get? Well, it wouldn't be Zen Robot Ninja, that's for sure. Maybe somebody like John Hayes from Munster and Ireland years ago. He looked like a bull, didn't he? And I mean that as a compliment. And that's it. Thanks for your MRS fans questions. Uh, let's move on now to my awards of the Six Nations. Right then, time to hand out my prestigious awards of the Six Nations. First up, try of the tournament. Oh, I think you all know who that's going to be. That's going to be Van der Meeuwen's try for Scotland against England. That was some try. Facial hair of the tournament. Oh, there's quite a few choices here, but uh, Mac Hansen takes it. Funniest fan moment? Well, it wasn't funny for a Welshman, but it was funny. A uh, young Welsh fan in the game against England. The look on his face is a picture blessing. Coach of the tournament? Well, Andy Farrell. No doubt whatsoever, but let's give a shout out to the whole coaching team there as well, who've been there supporting him as well. Game of the tournament? Well, there's been a couple of good, exciting ones, but I think we have to go back to Ireland, France in Dublin. The two best teams in the Six Nations, and you know what? They could be the two best teams in the World Cup as well. Who knows, but they certainly are on top form. Record breaker of the tournament? Well, what about Johnny Sexton at 30? Is it 38, 37, 39? Could be even 40, who knows? But what a player, still at the top of his game and beating Ronan Agara's record as well to become the uh, highest point scorer in Six Nations history. Shout out as well for George North, beating Shane Williams and becoming Wales' all-time top Six Nations try scorer. Player of the tournament, oof, this is a tough one. Do you know what, I think I'm going to go for Keelan Doris, I think. Dupont is probably the best player in the world at the moment, but for the Six Nations and Ireland's success as well, and Keelan Doris was a huge part of that, so it's been very tough, but he's my choice. That's it for Whistle Watch for this series. Uh, thanks very much for your company. It's been a pleasure to answer your Emirates fans question. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I do. And I'm sure we'll catch up again during the year for what promises to be a wonderful year of rugby. Uh, but before we go, good luck to all the nations competing in the Women's Six Nations, which is now starting shortly. Good luck to all of them. And uh, until the next time, bye bye.